Christ in our sin, you make us alive. How can we ever hold it inside? We can't hold back. No. We're going to lift you higher, higher. Hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. We're never going to stop singing. This time of year, this season of the year, especially September, the crisp mornings take me back to September the 11th, 2001. And and as I think about 2001, as I think about 9-11, I think about bravery. I think about heroes. I think about two former United States Marine Corps uh, veterans who put their uniforms back on and searched through the rubble of Ground Zero uh, that could have collapsed at any moment. They actually found two survivors, Sergeant, uh, these two men, Sergeant Jason Thomas and Sergeant Dave Carnes. Heroes. I think of two flight attendants, Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney, who were on Americans, American Flight 11 and calmly relayed information to, uh, on the hijackers to help, and, and help determine actually who they were and who they were working for. They both perished that morning. I think of two unarmed F-16s that were scrambled in the Washington, D.C. area. They took off so quickly they were not even armed. But two pilots, one of those being Major Heather Penny, who was willing to fly her airplane into another airplane, if need be, and give her life for her country and save untold, untold lives. I think of a tour guide at the Pentagon, Army Specialist Ben Dobinsky, who was working as a tour guide on the other side of the Pentagon when the plane hit and ran to the side of the damage and went in as a medic, as a, as, and he was trained, a trained EMT, he went in and, and risked his life to save many. 
And then who can forget Flight 93 and the brave men and women who literally gave their lives and took down a plane that would have crashed into the Capitol building of the United States, killing hundreds if not more. You see, when you're faced with impossible situations, and those things happen, there's nothing like the strength that God gives. Nothing like finding strength in a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The stories of Scripture reveal real people who've not only tasted the joys, but the sorrows of life. Now, jumping into this series entitled Brave and looking at brave faith this week, I want us to get to know Joshua a little bit better as we begin our time. Joshua is a book of victory on the heels of defeat. Chapter 1, we're introduced to Joshua. That's when, he's, that's when he's given the charge of Israel. And Moses is dead. That's the, that's the line. Moses, my servant, is dead. And many of you know Dr. Jim Deal. He uses that sermon, a sermon called Moses is Dead, when he's installing a new district superintendent. He's telling the people, Moses is dead. You've got a new leader now. And so he's, Joshua heard that. from Moses is dead. Now, now it's yours. And you can follow Joshua from chapter 1. In, in fact, it's, it's almost like it's his journal. I don't know how many of you journal. I journal often. This is one I'm working through right now and journaling through now. I write to my grandkids and I write other things. But this is, this is what we have in the book of Joshua. His journal from his beginning to his end in chapter 24 where he dies. The whole story. Chapter 1, he's introduced, but it didn't begin there. Because he's not just Moses' replacement. Look with me at Exodus 24. Look at what it says. And then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me in the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and went up to the mountain of God. And then look here in Exodus chapter 33. Look what it says. The Lord spake to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friends. Wait, I don't just read that quickly. Wouldn't it be amazing if our lives reflected that? Moses and God are friends, and it says, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He's waiting there. You see, he's watched Moses. He's followed Moses. He's learned from Moses, and he said, I want what he's got. I want that kind of a relationship with God. I want that. I need that. I desire that. And then in Joshua, excuse me, Deuteronomy 31, which is... Uh, setting up Joshua for us in our understanding. Look at the end of chapter 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tabernacle, a meeting that I may inaugurate him. Or one version says, give him charge. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle, a meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and, a pillar of, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And then verse, or chapter 1, as I mentioned a moment ago, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, by the way, he's called Moses' assistant there. Uh, son of none, Moses' assistant. Uh, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, and the land which I am giving to them, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. This whole book is about brave faith. This whole book is about Bravely trusting a God that said, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and Joshua said, okay. I believe it. Uh, there's, a, there's a promise I don't want you to miss here. And it's no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And then in verse 6, be strong and of good courage. 
For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right hand to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do, we talked about that last week, according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This is God's promise to him. Don't miss what we're learning about Joshua here. We're learning what God said to Joshua, what God promised to Joshua. And I want you to hear what, what, what we see. You can't be a good leader. You can't be a good follower. You can't be who God's called you to be without spending time in this book right here. Amen? In this book. Don't let the book depart Don't let its wisdom depart. And so, lead them. Go. Moses is dead. Go do what I'm telling you to do. This is your time. This is your day. This is your moment. (laughs) You see, if, if you don't spend time in the book, you're not going to be the way God wants, shaped the way God wants you to be. Joshua was called. Now, there's a difference between a calling and a an assignment or a a um, uh, career there's a difference because when you're called if the bottom falls out okay but you're called if things go wrong I don't like this but I'm called when things don't make sense and I feel like quitting I'm a pastor I never felt like quitting I can't because I'm called the people oh, the people that jeremiah was a young guy that, that, that god called to be a prophet and uh, you know what he told him he said jeremiah i'm calling you and by the way being a prophet in jeremiah's day was not a classy act people hated prophets they spit on prophets they threw rocks at prophets because prophets told them what god said and they didn't want to hear what god said and it wasn't popular and as, Joshua, or as Jeremiah is called, God told Jeremiah, whatever you do, don't look at their faces. Years ago, I was preaching a revival in Ashland, Kentucky, and I'm preaching along. And the first night, a guy sat right there. And he sat there like this. Now, I, I don't, I've never, it, I, I would define it as a scowl. A scowl. He just, he just looked at me with such a... And, and the second night, he was right there. And I've got to tell you, I thought, man, sit somewhere else. If you're going to look like that, sit. But he was right there. So every time I'd swing this way, I would look that way, and my eyes would just be drawn right to his scowl. About the third night, he, he caught me at the door, and he said, Pastor, he said, this, this meeting's changed my life. Thank you. <laughs> I felt so bad. I just felt so bad. And... and, and but, but I was looking at his face. Jo- Jeremiah, don't look at their face. Joshua, you're leading now. And I can imagine as Joshua begins to lead in chapter 1, there are people that knew Moses, and Moses would never do it like that. What's he thinking? This doesn't make any sense to me. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, going into this place, there's danger. Moses would never do that. You know, when I went to Plymouth Heights, my previous pastor at the pastor there did, gave me a great gift. He did, he did this a week before I came. He said to the congregation, he says, don't you dare compare him to me. That was a great gift. He gave me a great gift. Moses and Joshua are not the same. The day that they were living, it's not the same. Here's where we are. By the way, as I tell you this story, this is Joshua 6. As I tell you this story... Pretend like you've never heard it. Would you do that just for the moment today? Pretend like it's a new thing and you've never heard it before. Because what's happening is, this is Normandy. This is D-Day. They are here, headed into the promised land. Jericho's critical. 
Because the northern part of Israel, which it's a strip that goes down about right there, or a little farther down into the Sinai there, this is, a, this is Israel right along here. Jericho is critical because if they, if they attack that large fortified city and they destroy it, then everybody's going to hear about it. And the word's going to get out and it's going to be something that, that is influential. And so Jericho is key to where they're headed. And they come to the Jordan, they cross the Jordan, and Jericho's before them right now. And chapter 6 verse 1 says this. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. The word had already gotten out. God was with these guys. And so when they marched toward Jericho, they, they heard about the waters parting. They heard about the, the God that they served. And so they, they do what they, you, know, they, you talk about Florida battening down the hatches. That's what they did. They shut the doors and locked it up tight. Nobody went out or nobody came in. So when they walk across, you know, we think obeying God is so easy. It's going to be so easy just to serve the Lord. Let me tell you, when you're serving God, Satan hates you. And the battle is just beginning. They're marching into uncharted territory, but it was promised them by God. And so they're obeying God. Just because you obey God doesn't mean things will, will not go the, way you, will go the way you think. Just because you obey God doesn't mean everything's going to work out the way you want. Just because you obey God doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, it's going to get real tough. But you've got, an, you've got a mighty God on your side. So they're marching in to this new territory. And they're finding it laid out before them. See, what we like to do is we like to think, I imagine Joshua's going, okay, okay, there's the city, I see it. I see, I'm going to need some rope, I'm going to need some ladders, I'm going to need some swords and, and some spears and some, some of those things that, yeah, the, 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 keep us safe, I need some arrows, and how many we got, and thinking about all of these things. And God comes to Joshua, and he says, Joshua, I've got the plan. Here it is. I promise it to you. I've got the plan. And so I'm kind of picturing this in my mind as I'm, as I'm working through this this week. And, and they're getting everything lined up and everything together. And, and uh, Joshua, I've got the plan. And Joshua says, okay, all right. So he's ready to go. All right, all right, all right. Arrows, ladders, right? Okay, go ahead. What is it, God? Tell me what it is. So he looks at Joshua and he says, I've given Jericho to your hand. And the mighty men of valor. It's all yours. Now, we read that and we think, okay, it's a promise from God. Joshua, you sort of believe it and go on. Put yourself in Grove City, Ohio, right now. You're standing in Grove City. You're looking up I-71, and you see downtown Columbus. You see those skyscrapers. And God says, I'm giving you that. That's yours. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to win this. I'm going to give it to your hand. The, the mayor and all the, everybody that's, everybody's defending it or, or, or could stop you, I'm just putting them all in your hands. I'm going to do it all. That's the weight of this. That's, the, that's, that's how big this was. And so Joshua was paying attention. God, you've got the plan. What's the plan? And okay, here it is, verse 3. He says, you shall march around the city with all the men of war. Okay. All right, got it? All right. Arrows? No, okay. All right, all right, here we go. You shall go around the city once, and this shall you do six days. And Joshua says, okay, yeah, yeah, got it, okay, got it. The seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Okay, got that, yeah, uh-huh. The seventh day you shall march around seven times. Okay, all right, all right. Sure, got it, got it, got it. And the priest shall blow the trumpets. Okay, all right. So he's writing it all down. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you shall hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Okay, all right, all right. And the people shall go up, or the walls shall fall flat, Wait, wait, wait. What? What? The walls are going to... Wait a minute. We're, we haven't done anything yet, God. No, wait a minute. No, no, no. We, we have this idea that we're going to do this. And God says, I've got the plan. It may sound incredibly obtuse. It may sound incredibly off the mark. 
The people shall go up every man straight before him. No ladders, no ropes, no, no, no spears, no swords. Do you know what? I love this passage because it is so anti-human. That makes no sense to me. It may not have made any sense to Joshua. Now, can you imagine the people when Joshua starts dishing this out? We're going to do what? To every missionary, it was called of God to go somewhere that sold everything they owned. It made no sense. To every person who walked away from a career that would have made them hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars just to follow God, it made no sense. To someone who walked away from potential or decided or felt called to plant a church or start a ministry, it made no sense. Same scenario. And here's Joshua. And God's given him the plan. It's impossible. (laughs) This is where brave faith comes in. Terry and I were married in 1981. The year before we got married, we we planted a garden. And uh, we raised a bunch of green beans. Everything else died a horrible death. It was awful. So... When Terry and I got married in the spring of the next year, we had canned a bunch of green beans. Now, I like green beans, but eat green beans every day. You know, you can take potatoes, you can do all kinds of things with potatoes. Potatoes went bad, so, but green beans, we had plenty of green beans. And I was making $5 an hour as a management trainee for Hart's stores, and uh, we had a little Pinto's, 1972 Pinto station wagon. And we lived in a trailer, a little trailer my dad owned. And we're, 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 in this, we're in this situation in our lives where we're just getting by. And I remember, I remember the tires were going bad on my car, and it was late in the year. And so we've, she and I, uh, we've learned one thing in our marriage, that God's first. Amen? And if I've got a need... Before I, I do anything else, I'm going to tell God. This is what we did. We prayed. We prayed. I went to work and, uh, with green beans <laughs> for lunch and, and probably a peanut butter sandwich, something like that, you know. And so I was preaching at a church in southern Ohio down in um, Scioto County. I, I wasn't a pastor, but I'd been invited to preach. It was a Wednesday night service or something like that. I'd, I'd get called to those when I first started pa- preaching. And so I remember going in and preaching. I remember coming back out and got my keys out. That's back when you used a key to get in your car. And, and, I, and I started to put my key in the car. And the key wouldn't go in the keyhole. And I reached down. And there was a $50 bill stuck in the keyhole of my car. Nobody knew but God. Now that's back when I could go buy two recap tires. Anybody remember recap tires? About two recap tires and put them on that car and 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 we took ten dollars that was left and uh, we bought some flour and sugar and butter and whatever else for ten dollars. That's how my wife still cooks to this day, just throwing stuff together and and we had what we needed till we got some um, some more money. I'm gonna tell you something. And that you say well, that's a little thing. It was a big thing to me. One more quick story here, and this was. A few years later, it was after Katrina, I know, because we were uh, at the church there putting together boxes, and you'd put these, these rescue boxes, you had these uh, 20 little bags in there of soap and toothpaste and all this stuff, and I remember we were going through the church cleaning up or something, and there was all this stuff left over. There was, in the, in the bag, or in the boxes there, there were things left over. There was um, toothpaste and toothbrushes and bar soap didn't fit in the rest of the, the packages we were building, so we had it left over. It in a, and it sit there for, I mean, half a year. And uh, somebody said, get, let's get that out of there. And so I, I, I remember calling uh, uh, Calvin, uh, Ray Evans, Cal Evans, and I said, he's always working with different ministries. I said, you know, anybody needs anything, I need to give some stuff away. And we had a lot. It was a lot. And 
He said, I got one guy I might, might do it. He's named John Foster. He runs an organization called Veterans Helping Veterans, and it was getting toward Christmas. And he said, uh, call him. He sent me his number. I called John Foster. I said, John, this is, this is Tim Throckmorton. I said, I've got, I got a bunch of to- toothpaste. I got a, a whole bunch of toothbrushes and bar soap. And uh, he started crying. I said, hey, man, um, I'm, are you okay? I said, I, you want it? I mean, I didn't know what was going on. He said, Tim, I'm sitting in the parking lot of Kroger's and I'm getting ready to go into Kroger's and I'm getting ready to buy toothpaste and toothbrushes and bars of soap for the veterans. Now let me tell you something. The God of heaven that knew about the need of toothbrushes and bars of soap and a little bit of money for a little hillbilly couple down in southern Ohio is the same God that was speaking to Joshua and telling him, I've got the plan. You just trust me. Let your faith be brave. And so here's what happened. I don't need to tell you the whole story or read you the whole story. But as they marched up and they did exactly what God said, exactly the way God said to do it, the walls, as they shouted on that seventh day, fell down flat to the ground and they marched in and they took the city that God gave them. If you believe that, say amen. Exactly what God said would happen, that's what happened. And then you say, why should we be surprised? (laughs) You know, that wall meant nothing to God. He could see over it. (laughs) He knew what was in there. He knew who was in there. And, And every wall that we face, that doesn't surprise God. God can see over that wall. He knows what's ahead of us. This most, this, it's the most awesome moment in the life of a believer when you're at the center of answered prayer. And they experienced God's touch. So here's our focus. Two things. Two things to, to bank on. Two things to take home. Two things to say, these are truths. And I must never forget them. The first one is this. What God promises, God accomplishes. What God promises, God accomplishes. It's not always easy. It may not make sense. It may not be comfortable. Some people, we look at the story of Joshua, and when he's getting the orders to do what he's doing, we say, Joshua, just do what God says. Don't forget the weight of this. It was big. It was massive. And it was overwhelming, but Joshua listened and Joshua did exactly what God said to do. Because what God promises, God accomplishes. The question is, do I live like that is so? Do I live my life like that is true? Which leads me to the second truth. God's abundant blessings do not diminish the importance of obedience. Now hear hear me. I'm convinced that Joshua had to do everything that God said the way God said. I mean, they had to go march out. They had to be in the order God said. They had to go around the right way that God said. They had to do exactly what God said. That was obedience to God. And and sometimes we think, well, you know, God's going to overlook this. He's going to overlook that. And, and God doesn't care if I do this or that. Please hear me. Please hear me carefully. God's abundant blessings do not diminish the importance of obedience. We here in this country are challenged in a unique way. Because we're blessed beyond measure. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln was, was issuing a prayer pro- proclamation to the country. And he, he said in this proclamation, in about the third paragraph, he said, We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We've forgotten the gracious hand that preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched us and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all the blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Here's the line. Don't miss this line. It's it's, it's profound intoxicated with unbroken success we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace too proud to pray to the God that made us you say well 
Man, Israel saw God work. They'll never forget this. Oh, but they do. And we will learn in subsequent gatherings like this how important obedience is. I want to... I, I, I'm trying to remember the, 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 the quote, William, uh, not William Forsyth, Peter, Peter Forsyth said the first duty of every soul is not to find freedom, but to find its master. Thomas Kempis said instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever, arri- uh, whoever strives to withdraw from obedience is withdrawing from God's amazing grace. Andrew Bonar, who is a prolific writer in the book Pursuit of Holiness, um, he said, it's not, it's not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver that is to be the standard of obedience. Some indeed might reckon such minute and arbitrary rules as trifling. But the principle involved in obedience or or disobedience was none other than the same principle that was tried in the Garden of Eden at the foot of the forbidden tree. It's really this. Is the Lord to be obeyed in all things whatsoever He commands? You want something to tweet? You want something to stick out there? How about this? The cost of obedience is nothing compared to the cost of disobedience. Nothing compared. Joshua will carry this throughout his journal. He will end his life, he will end his life with with this testimony to Israel, his people that he's led. He'll leave his life or leave them with these words, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell. Hear this, hear this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord talk about brave faith our national history gives us a a character from the 1700s by the name of Patrick Henry who stood in St. John's Church in Richmond Virginia and he said this I why stand we idle what is it the gentlemen wish what would they have is life so dear or peace so sweet to be purchased at the chains of slavery Forbid it, Almighty God. I don't know what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. You talk about bravery in faith. I started this morning with a story, and I'm going to end with one. Uh, It's a story of a young man who on 9-11 worked at um, uh, at an office in in World Trade Center 1. 24-year-old equities trader uh, by the name of Wells Crowther. He called his mom and left a voicemail. Mom, this is Wells. I want you to know that I'm okay. It was 9, 12 a.m. Those are the last words that anyone ever heard from Wells. Some of the details of what happened next remain a mystery, but mystery, but through determination, uh, they, they found some clues, and his parents uncovered a story of heroism that would touch a nation. Uh, Wells was a lot like a lot of us, not a bit better. Uh, an honor student, not the valedictorian, a Division I athlete, uh, not a star. But from the time he was in preschool, uh, growing up, he wanted to be a fireman, and he became a volunteer fireman. And then he got a job after he graduated from college at 24 years of age. He uh, he began to work for an organization called Sander o- O'Neill, a powerful investment banking company in World Trade Center. He carried a red bandana in his pocket because one day he asked his dad for a hanky like he had in his pocket, and he gave him that red bandana, and then he gave him a hanky for his pocket. He said, that's for your pocket. Don't wipe your nose with it, son. He handed him a red bandana. He said, hey, put that in your back pocket. He said, carry that around. It always comes in handy. And he did that till the day he died. And on that day, um, 
according to records, as the wing of Flight 175 burst through the wall, the sky lobby on the 78th floor, on the floor lay a young lady by the name of Lean Young who was injured and couldn't walk, dead bodies all around her, and then she heard a voice, a young man who called out to her, and he said, I found the stairs, follow me, help anyone you can as we go, and he was very young, she said, not very husky, but she remembered him wearing a white t-shirt and a red bandana, (laughs) he was carrying a woman over his shoulder, she didn't know who the woman was, but he had carried her for many, many floors. And at the 61st floor, he urged them to go on on their own. He said, I'm going back to help others. And he never came out. Today at the 9-11 Memorial Museum, you can see a display to the 2,977 who died during the attacks. And there is a special display with a red handkerchief in it in honor of this young man. Hear me this morning. There is someone... There is someone who knows you and desires to lead you through the ground zeros of life. Who will be close, who will stick closer than a brother. And you talk about someone who rescues, someone who delivers, someone who protects. That's what he does. And he says, be brave. Trust me with your faith. Put your faith in me. I will not fail you. You can trust in me. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through. But the call today is for every one of us to have a brave faith in a mighty 